uh, welcome to the show. In our show, the differentiators, we talk to achievers from various backgrounds to understand their journey, to help us unlock key insights and ideas that will stimulate our learning and growth. I'm your host, Aditya, and I have my co-host, Yashas and uh, Shreyas with me. So our differentiator for today is uh, Divyan Shapodar, who is the CEO and Chief Educator at Rocketeers Research Institute. So uh, Rocketeers Research Institute is a tech-enabled platform providing step-by-step -step path to go and become the spacecraft builders of tomorrow, irrespective of their location and formal education. Uh, he holds a bachelor's degree from the Indian Institute of Space Science and Technology. So, uh, so let's hear from him uh, how uh, he's transforming education uh, to playground. So, uh, thank you, Divyanshu. Thanks for thanks for joining us. Uh, thank you, Aditya. Uh, sounds fun. I hope we have an interesting discussion. Sure, sure. We hope for the same. Uh, so I'll just start off with, with my first question. So I think you uh, you did your bachelor's at uh, Indian Institute of uh, Space Science and Technology. So uh, can you just talk about the experience there? So what did you study? How was your uh, how was your education there? So Aditya, uh, not only like uh, Indian Institute of Space Science and Technology is a college that is directly under ISRO. It was started uh, in 2007 uh, and uh, the first director was uh, Dr. B.N. Suresh. It was sort of his uh, vision and his sort of mission that he created that institution. So when I joined uh, way back in 2009, uh, at that time, uh, the college was still just three years old. There, ha there was no alumni, there was no campus, there was no infrastructure. Um, our counseling for the admissions happened in a hotel in Trivandrum and uh, you know, the campus that was there was uh, what is called ATF in Vikram Sarabhai Space Center. So it's a, it's basically the guest house of Vikram Sarabhai Space Center. It's an ISRO guest house. And it's a small campus called ATF and it's right on the beach. It's it's in the backwaters near the Veli Church. So it's, it's, it's a very iconic site and it's beautiful. It's like living in a resort. Uh, we, we had... Uh, amazing hostels, uh, which were like, uh, you know, uh, it was like a hotel room. We each one had our own attached bathroom in the hostel and stuff like that. Our mess was like guest house mess. So, uh, so that way it was very jarring and uh, it was very, very unique and different. And because we were there as a part of the first three batches while the college was being built, it's a sort of experience logged in time. So students still go to Indian Institute of Space Science and Technology. Education is world class. The facilities and the labs that they have now are probably better than that than the ones that we had in the sense that they're designed for a college. They are not designed for some other purpose. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, the faculty base has increased. The research base has increased. The kind of projects that are happening now in terms of the satellites being built there and so on is much more uh, sort of detailed and uh, the variety is much higher compared to what it was in our time. Uh, but what we got to experience was a, a sort of experience logged in time where uh, we had BN Suresh sir, Radha Krishnan sir, uh, and people like them, like Kalam sir, just being there in campus around us, all these great ISRO scientists going into VSSC every other day. Uh, and so, so, so it was like we were there inside ISRO for those years. So uh, in that sense, it was a very unique experience. Uh, obviously, by the virtue of being in the middle of nowhere, about 30 kilometers from Trivandrum, it has its downsides considering as a college student, you want to enjoy life more as well and you want to go out. Going to Domino's was a six hours uh, sort of plan. <laughs> so uh, th that was probably the only downside, but otherwise the experience was a lot of fun. Um, the, on the curriculum side, also, we got a lot of exposure. We had people like KN9N. KN9N, uh, just to give you a background, he's, uh, so he's the inventor of what is called HTPB, which is uh, a binder in composite fuel that ISRO uses. It's also a very, very effective uh, binder and a fuel component in various solid rockets across the world. And uh, he's the guy who invented it. And... Uh, he was our chemistry teacher in first year and we didn't even know till like almost the 35th lecture that, okay, this is the person who's responsible for this type of stuff. And uh, so, so yeah, we had people like that available as mentors to us. So it was a lot of fun. Right. Um, yeah. yeah so that's nice to hear. And uh, 
Like, uh, I just wanted to go a bit backward and uh, actually hear about what actually made you to choose this as your career, you know? Uh, because in India, uh, being engineers, there's a lot of things, but what made you uh, concentrate on this space right now? So, uh, see, people who are passionate about space, most of them are passionate right from the start. And uh, like, you know, you'll hear almost every aerospace engineer or someone who's there in the space industry talk about like, huh, I, I used to love rockets and space when I was a child. I used to read these books. I read these novels, that author, this movie. So, so that's something that I think is, 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 is an underlying current to the whole industry and to the whole segment of space stuff whether it's astronomy, cosmology, physics, or rockets, or satellites, or, or whichever sort of segment you might want to go to. So yeah, even I was like that. So I was always sort of interested in space, read a lot of books uh, about space. Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy was definitely one of the first uh, very, very impactful uh, introductions to space stuff. Also Star Wars. Um, I saw Star Wars, the first movies, uh, like the, uh, the original Star Wars trilogy. Uh, when I was just nine years old. And uh, uh, so definitely that was uh, something that was a lot of fun. Always wanted to do this. Uh, that was uh, something that was there. So when I got into IST, so I, at our time, IST used to be through ITJ. There was no other separate examination. We used to go get admissions to the main list. Uh, and I could have chosen some of the other IITs and uh, sort of done something else. But... Uh, First of all, even in the IITs, if I wanted to choose, I wanted to choose aerospace engineering. Um, and even after that, uh, just when I heard about this college and the way it was, and it was inside ISRO, you got to, uh, you got an opportunity to work in ISRO and you got to meet all these people. And so, so it was, no, it was a no brainer for me. Like uh, it was uh, a very easy decision to just come in and uh, do this. Yeah, uh, so uh, you have started the uh, Rocket AS. Before that, you had started another company. Pubbed Up. It's called Pubbed Up. Okay, okay. So uh, yeah. uh, how, how did that start? How did your entrepreneurial journey so, start into this? So, uh, while I was, uh, so this is 2014. Um, in 2014, I was in Bangalore. Uh, this was uh, right after college. I was there in ISRO. I was uh, 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 doing a trainee project there uh, in ISAC uh, in URSC. And uh, so uh, I had a friend who had, uh, who was uh, already an entrepreneur. He was, he had a location based services startup at that time called Ruto, which was bought off by Jabong. Uh, and uh, so he was there and we used to hang out and like we used to go out for beers. So, and uh, I was a student uh, and he was also sort of out of a job at that point of time. Uh, and the beer bill was getting fairly high. Uh, and uh, so we decided to somehow figure out a way to reduce our beer bills. And uh, that's how Pubbed Up came along. So it was, a, it was an app that was there available to microbreweries, um, which would provide loyalty points to customers over the app. Uh, and which would then translate into offers. So, so that was the concept. Um, at that point of time, there was no dine out. Uh, and uh, the, so obviously that segment grew a lot. Uh, we did some things. We basically concentrated on our beers. <laughs> so uh, yeah, we did that for a while. Uh, that was about it. And like, uh, I, I think we did that for about 11 months. And then I moved out of Bangalore. Even uh, Edward moved on to something else. So Okay, so then uh, then you started Rocket Airs, which is a new space yeah. uh, segment. So uh, uh, company. yeah, we started. So I started Rocket Airs. So I actually started working full time on it in sometime around December 2014. Uh, okay. But uh, the company properly began uh, in May 2015. Okay. Right. So. Yeah. Uh, so, can you define the term new space? Yeah. So, uh, so first of all, if you look at the classical way of defining space, what used to happen was that space was a affair of governments. You know, the U.S. government used to be doing space. Russian government used to be doing space. Chinese government, Japanese government, European government, Indian government. So, 
whenever you have something like this which is very very government controlled it's usually very very large it is not very agile it is it moves slowly it has set directions there are committees there are meetings there are sub committees there are decisions there are paperwork which is signed in triplicate then sent from one department to another then comes back with one document less then goes back again then comes back again and then gets signed again then gets approved then the money gets paid and then maybe something happens right uh, so that was and it's a lot of money it's not less money it's a lot of money and it's slow and it's bureaucratic and it's large so that's what space on a broad level used to be for the last 40 years and in this format we created a lot of stuff we we created a space station which is doing amazing research uh, we created the global infrastructure for navigation for weather monitoring for earth observation for gis based applications so many for telecom oh my god it's it's a game changer and but because it's a big government big sort of a slow affair you know you don't have a situation where the general public at large can just take advantage of it like you know building roads is a big government affair but every day as general public you and me we can drive on that road that is built and experience it in a very real way and we can think of doing something different with it that others might not be doing i might build some different car and try and test it out on real roads or something like that right so and we can do that um uh, or maybe you know just if it's my colony and it's my home i might have a wedding and i might block it but i'm using it right and um, so so but but space we really can't do that it 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 was expensive it was uh, the cost of access was very high and it was slow and agile and it was very bureaucratic and government oriented new space is now a philosophy of way a way of doing space as a private entrepreneur or as a private entity which is fast which is agile which is very very agile things move very very fast so if you're launching a satellite you promise you design a system today you launch your first satellite you launch your second satellite you launch your third satellite the first satellite and third satellite don't have anything in common it's a completely updated design so that's not the way space is in general always followed because the cost is so high that you want to make sure that whatever you are sending there works and it does not create debris that is why systems are tested extensively there are heritage values that's how the government used to move today it's a different perspective the idea is that if it doesn't work we'll bring it down we'll deorbit it we'll do something with it some people are doing it irresponsibility and irresponsibly and they may not be taking into account the space debris but as a whole the industry wants to take care of that and they realize that it's a problem but yeah the overall philosophy is changed the philosophy is now of very agile application fast low cost happening again and again trying to make it accessible and easy to do uh, so that there comes a point of time where instead of thinking of space as the way we do we start thinking of space just as another place to go to Right. so so that's the primary difference we've moved from that big government slow bureaucratic thing to a child fast new entrepreneurial cool chick thing so okay. uh, what was the idea behind uh, rocketeers so was it only education or was it uh, something else apart from uh, only education so uh, what was the idea behind starting that so uh, education is definitely one aspect of it and it may be the one of the largest aspects to it but overall uh, what rocketeers aims to do is that uh, we aim to enable a rocketry ecosystem in india india as a country has always been amongst the most pioneering nations when it comes to space tech and uh, we we did this under this grand vision of vikram sarabhai where we decided to be second to none in application of space technology for the betterment of society this created a civil space program that was the world's first civilian first space program first and only actually almost all other space programs are national security defense first then the civilian aspects started coming in india flipped that and india said that okay we are going to do this for the people and then slowly we realized that obviously it has applications in defense and we have to take care of our borders uh, so uh, that came as a secondary thing but we are a civilian first program and uh we whatever we've done the way isro has done it and the way we have approached space technology has been in that direction into benefiting 
society at large, whether it's the fishermen, whether it's weather monitoring, whether it's evacuation and disaster management, whether it's farmers, uh, whether it is telemedicine and teleeducation, uh, and so on. Uh, but somehow, we missed the train of rocketry. In the US, um, every year, they're flying more than 12 million model rockets. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's an ecosystem that creates thousands and thousands of scientists and engineers who go on to do amazing stuff over there because they can make that tech and make that experience real from them for themselves, even as children. And it becomes a part of the kind of project that children might be doing and uh, enthusiasts might be doing. Uh, it, it's, it's, a, it's a fabric in the culture. And um, India doesn't have that. When we started Rocketeers, India was flying on average less than 500 rockets a year through the country, people working in pockets, no standardization, nothing happening, no regulation, no policy. So we spent a lot of time in first trying to understand. And I built model rockets as a student in college. Um, and I could not get a single component, single part, single thing, single support in India at all. I literally had to import components and parts from the US. The cost of building a single rocket for me was about 10,000 rupees. And over the college, we built four or five that were from the US and it cost us a lot of money. The rest we did build from ourselves from scratch in the college, but we had access to amazing labs and amazing teachers. So we were able to do that. Not everyone will be able to sort of build everything from scratch. And uh, because they may not even have access to the resources, even if they can go ahead and do hands on work. Um, so what that led to was uh, understanding that, okay, this is something that should be there in India. There is no good reason for it not to be there. It's amazing. And uh, just people just don't have access. So we spent a lot of time in sort of trying to understand what is the problem? Why does it not happen in India? And uh, we came to realize that there are a lot of people who are very interested in rocketry who don't get access. And then there are some people who are able to build up stuff and who go ahead and do some things in small, small pockets here and there. They're hardcore enthusiasts. And usually they're working on a private level in the sense that they're trying to build their own rocket. So they, they might go and take some outreach classes in their schools mm -hmm. and in the colleges or schools or colleges around them. But at the core level, they're trying to build their own rocket. Like for example, Rajesh Munishwar or Pratham Amla or some of these other people who who built amateur rockets and who've done amazing work. Like there's this college in Orissa called BSSUT. Those guys have been doing some stuff. So, uh, and there's Bit Mesra. So all of these people, they, they do some stuff, but it's about building their own rocket. It's not about really building that ecosystem where everyone is building a rocket. Everybody who wants to can build a rocket. Um, then one thing that came up was that there is no policy, no regulation, no government licensing, nothing. There's no structure, no permission structure. Everything is very messy and it's not conducive for anybody to do stuff. It's very difficult, right? And then finally, the fourth part of the problem came in where we realized that another thing is that there is no material available. There are no components. There are no safety systems. There are no launch pads. There are no ignition systems. There are no fuel cartridges. Um, standard fuel, safe fuel cartridges, which you can use reliably and be sure that you won't hurt yourself or others. Um, and that's the problem we started concentrating on. And that's the problem that we're solving, where we are standardizing all of this material made in India for India, designed in a way that it works for Indian audiences and customers. So we've, we've been making components, subcomponents, DIY kits, launch pads, ignition systems, some safety gear, uh, other motor making kit, testing kits, fuel cartridges. So all of these things we're making available as a buyout product. You can like literally go to our website and buy it and just do stuff. So that's the idea. And we felt that regulation and policy is something that needs a certain amount of critical mass. Once India is flying 10 lakh rockets a year, automatically the government will start looking at it and regulating it. So we first need to get there. Uh, so uh, this is a very exciting thing to you know talk about rockets. Uh, but uh, once what we see is what's majorly work has been done has been through the government side. And uh, why isn't the private sector stepped into it? And even we see small shoots starting up, but how long would you think that will take to actually take proper do it? So, uh, yeah, there are uh, constraints there. And if you look at the U.S. ecosystem again, because U.S. is a pioneering nation when it comes to this sort of uh, this industry. So we have to look at how things have 
grown there and how things have happened. So if you looked at NASA even as early as like let's say uh, even as late as let's say 2006 or 2005, which is just 15 years ago, right? Um, even at that time, NASA was a or, or the U.S. ecosystem was a fairly government-controlled uh, sort of NASA ecosystem. Whatever vendor network was there was very NASA IP and NASA controlled, just like India. So if you look at uh, the Indian ecosystem right now, it's uh, basically ISRO. ISRO does everything. ISRO then tells, say, a company like Data Patterns, okay, I'm building satellites. I need this, 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 this stuff. This is how it's made. You make it for me and you set up the factory. You invest some money into it. I'm going to buy this stuff from you regularly. And you don't need to worry about any other customers. This is not your IP. You cannot use my IP to create other products. If you are doing that, there is a licensing procedure for it and so on. Um, same thing happens with say HAL or LNT or Walchandar Nagar Industries or uh, Paras or there are more than 500 companies right across the country. There are very government like ISRO is the primary customer. 80% of their revenues come from ISRO right um, and uh, some of them have developed their own stuff like for example Walchandar Nagar does pressure vessels now and whatever applications of pressure vessels is happening they build that stuff. For ISRO they build uh, fuel tanks. So uh, now in the US around 2007-2008 they started instituting a change where they where NASA said that I will concentrate on R&D, on research, on taking this to new heights uh, so called and I will let everything that is established as a system to be done by private people in an open sort of a format which is transparent which enables people to do it there will be buyback contracts there will be official bidding processes there will be uh, other sort of funding mechanisms other mechanisms for the private industry to come in and do stuff and over the 12 to sort of 15 year period you've seen the ecosystem over there change very drastically it's 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 amazing there are now thousands and thousands of companies which are doing all kinds of stuff. The big names you and me both have heard like SpaceX or Virgin or uh, Blue Origin or uh, you know uh, Planet and Capella and you can just go on and on. Right. Um, India uh, up till now has been a very very uh, sort of cautious country in this regard. India did try its hands at hardcore privatization and burnt, it, burnt its hands a few times. So, for example, the whole Devas debacle. The idea was for India to sort of start licensing out frequency and being able to do stuff and let private companies do their own thing. But you know what happened, right? It, it, it became a whole thing. Um, and more than a scandal, it was just a policy in the sense that somebody was trying to do something for the first time and they just didn't know how. Right? And that was the problem. There was no mal intent. At least that's what I understand. Maybe I'm wrong. Um, but now again we are sort of embarking on that journey with the new reforms that are happening and there's we yet to see how they really translate they've, they've done something but on ground basically we might be now sowing seeds of that same ecosystem sort of growing in India where you know you have a lot of private companies doing their own stuff end to end space and like sort of getting into that industrial uh, segmented mode and this would take along both the old vendors that we have, like companies like Data Patterns and so on, and also new players that are coming up, uh, say like Skyroot or Bellatrix or SatSearch or SatSure or so many of these others. Right. So uh, I think uh, as Rocketeers, you you have worked with the government of Telangana, uh, if I'm not wrong, to provide uh, education to rural students. Uh, you know. So how was that experience? Can you talk about that? So we are working with uh, what is called Mahatma Jyotiba Phule Backward Class Welfare Society for Education. And uh, this is under government of Telangana. This, is, uh, this has more than 260 schools in Telangana. Uh, these schools are free for students. Who, the students get selected on merit. And this is free for the ones who are there. Uh, so the government of Telangana is paying for the education. Uh, these are all boarding schools uh, and uh, they're obviously targeted at an underprivileged audience who need access to education and the government is working hard to sort of provide that. And that is why even in a small state like Telangana, uh, you have like so many of these schools, so they penetrate all uh, 
sort of districts and areas and they they go you can like child from everywhere in telangana can get access to a school like this uh and we are working with the society to introduce modern technology education so there are various purposes with which this lab was set up or these labs actually uh, there are already uh, three there and uh, soon the government is planning to expand it to every possible district and then slowly obviously over time we'll see what is the saturation point we'll see that every school should have access to some of the other facility even if it is multiple schools using a single facility uh but um, the idea is that one thing that is there is to be able to introduce technology to students where they start becoming used to technology that they have seen for the first time today uh, a major problem for students who don't have exposure is that even if you give them a computer they don't understand it they they, they feel that they're supposed not supposed to touch it and if they play with it it will break and they have that fear of technology and we need to take that away and we need to make them uh, be like ki ha theek hai i know this and i want to do this and i want to explore it and we want to inculcate that curiosity uh, instead of that uh, sort of move back from stuff like that so that's where one of these major purposes of these labs is where they start building and flying their own rockets as individual students that experience is so end to end that uh, you know they really start getting hang of you know just being able to go out there and do their own stuff and explore and not be scared to sort of you know touch things and break things and explore things and uh, so that's that's one of the fundamental values that we are sort of trying to inculcate apart from all the extra benefits of stem education so in terms of stem we are we are helping with physics and maths at a curriculum level where we have mapped the experiments and the projects that they do in the lab to fifth to 10th class uh, physics curriculum and 9 10th 11th 12th class maths and physics curriculum so uh, so the, the the kind of topics that they study in class they can do real world experiments and see for example uh, the concept of terminal velocity is introduced to them on a physics level for the first time in 9th class it's taken to a detailed mathematical level in 11th class the same thing they can do in the lab in 9th class they can build a parachute and see terminal velocity in 11th class they can build different types of parachute calculate terminal velocity observe it and map whether their calculations are correct so uh, so this is how we've sort of introduced these labs and that's the way that these labs are moving right so uh, what are the reactions of students who fly these model rockets so uh, the How best feedback feel? that i heard the best feedback that i i have sort of got directly from a student saying it to me is that uh, oh. i love science now okay so yeah that's that's a brilliant line like yeah sure go ahead <laughs> so uh, what are the programs uh, different programs conducted by rocket yes apart from model rocket building no so uh, we concentrate on the product we so as a company we concentrate on introducing rocket components and rocket products and expanding that range and making it cheaper so as i told you in college i spent almost 10000 rupees per rocket um as a company i'm already selling my cheapest rocket at 1000 rupees a rocket so uh, and then i'm going to take this down further so uh so as a company we are always concentrating on that hardware and trying to expand that range and make that more accessible and a uh, wider variety and being able to do different types of stuff uh, like soon we are planning to expand the size of our fuel cartridges we'll try and introduce more testing systems we'll try and introduce more payloads where you can sort of put cameras and stuff on on the thing uh, but uh, as a sort of program or delivery of education we try and work with as many partners as possible so uh, the delivery of education or the creation of the program is usually the partners thing for example we work as i said with government of telangana with this society where they are the ones who are delivering the education uh, the teacher training program is handled by us uh, then another partner that we work with is uh, tech kritya which is a atal tinkering lab vendor and uh, we are not partnered with atal tinkering labs directly but they are and they introduce rocketry in atal tinkering labs so uh, Tekritya is one such company in the Atal Tinkering Lab ecosystem. We are working with more than twelve, uh, twelve to fifteen partners already. Almost sixty to sixty-five percent Atal Tinkering Labs have rocketry, even though rocketry is not a part of the Atal Tinkering Lab mandate. 
So if you look at the structure of the lab as laid out by Niti Aayog, it does not have rocketry. But if you go go on ground and see, almost sixty percent of these labs have rocketry. So so that's the way that we work. We uh, another partner is Viz Robo. They take their own workshops. We enable them with rockets. They design their own workshops. They design their own audience. So it's it's the idea for us is to be able to create the product that they can then use and build on that. So how has the outreach uh, program been in India? How what is the geographical location that you have covered until now? So uh, we uh, so except for northeast, we have practically worked in every segment of the country. I think we've also not worked in Kashmir. Uh, but apart from that, we worked almost everywhere. Right. So from a from a revenue standpoint, uh, so collecting from what you have told, uh, I think the major concentration has been on school children, right? So, so uh, yeah, so we've been we've been working with colleges as well. So we we conduct a fixed annual program at IIST, Indian Institute of Space Science and Technology, my college, uh, every year. That happens in March. Um, it's a three-day long intensive rocketry program. Uh, each team gets to build two rockets. One is a standard design. The second one they design on their own. Um, and uh, we see all kinds of interesting stuff there. Uh, we see participation of more than 250 to 300 students every year. Um, then uh, one program that we're doing with another college is uh, with Manipal and uh, no, sorry, uh, Maharashtra Institute of Technology in Pune, Loni, uh, MIT Pune uh, in Loni. Uh, they have set up a, a propulsion lab where we've uh, built, designed, built, and supplied the whole equipment. So this includes uh, all the chemicals and all the tools that they need to first make their own propellant, convert it into fuel cartridges, uh, make sure that it's safe, test it in different ways, uh, test it for thrust, test it for mass flow rate, test it for nozzle efficiency. Um, and then build the rocket around it and fly it and do a flight test. So uh, they're able to get all kinds of data and they're able to do end-to-end -end sort of projects in that lab. Uh, they can experiment with different fuels as well. Um, they can create different shapes of cores. They can have different burn profiles. So this whole lab was designed by us and set up by us. Uh, so yeah. So yeah, there's a different type of segments. So the scale part of it happens more with schools, with colleges. The programs are more focused, more detailed, and sort of designed for the needs of the college, and so on. Uh, but yeah, slowly we'll try and sort of take that also in, into a very product-based approach. But let's see, uh, colleges need more focused help, and uh, we, we we'll see how that sort of pans out. But yeah, most of the work has been happening with schools. So with the uh, new national education policy coming up. Yeah. So how how is the how is rocketry is going to help it or? So uh, there are various things uh, in there that are definitely that look amazing. Uh, first of all, right now it's the document uh, implementation is yet to happen, and how the implementation will happen uh, becomes a major concern. And till we see that pan out, it's difficult to say how things will really change. Uh, but uh, on a broad level, uh, the focus on technology is amazing, uh, both at the primary and the secondary education levels. The kind of uh, focus on technology that the policy outlays is going to be something that's a game changer and is going to introduce activities like this at a much larger and deeper scale than that's there up till now. So that's definitely a good thing. In whatever format it happens, I'm sure there will be programs and there will be sort of modules that will be built around it and we will be able to draw benefit out of it and take this ecosystem forward. Um, apart from that, uh, I think the overall direction that the policy has taken is nice. We've, we've, we've also, so since ISRO is also reforming and that space segment is also reforming, uh, I work with, uh, so basically I'm a part of this uh, non-profit organization called Space Federation, Space Fed. Uh, this is a not-for-profit that's uh, a, a combined entity for all the space startups working in India. Uh, we, we try and include everyone possible. We already have more than 25 different uh, companies who are members. Uh, and uh, we try and combine all the things, uh, all the needs and all the policies, all the suggestions and all the, all the concerns that we might have from any department in the government and try to push them out to the government and tell them that, okay, this is the thing that we need. This is what we want. This is how you should do things. 
and uh, so we've been in uh, discussions with niti ayog with isro uh, with in space committee board and so on and we've suggested for them to come out with a strong uh, structured program that falls in line with national education policy we can call it the space education policy uh, and uh, we we we've been working there and we've been trying to create a system where isro itself starts enabling space oriented education as a part of this policy and a, and a structured vertical for it and so we were working on that as well uh, one point that we missed was uh, your experience at isro you worked at isro right so how was yeah, it yeah so it was <coughs> i was there for a very short period of time um i i really can't go into a lot of details uh, except for say that i was working at isac and uh, i was working under the team that was actually so i was working under the team i'll say i was very junior so uh, uh and i was working under the team that is working on the lander of chandrayaan 2 right so yeah uh, uh and uh, that's about it <laughs> <laughs> okay that's that's fine uh, we understand the uh, modalities that go in uh so the, in india there's always been this debate of uh, where the government should focus on should it focus on the developmental issues uh, with current focus in mind or should it focus on futuristic endeavors like space programs so, so i don't think take? that's an either or question it is not an either or question we need to do both so uh, we need to take care of our present and we need to take care of our future so there are lots of problems that are there uh, that we need to solve for right now and at the same time uh, there are a lot of things that if we draw inspiration and we look beyond and we look a lot of sort of uh, look towards our curiosity side and start doing th- stuff we may even come up with solutions for the present using that so uh, uh, if you look at uh, you know a lot of these uh, space tech oriented developments they have such wide variety of applications in our current lives improving the lives of farmers improving the life of fishermen and so so the focus is always on trying to make those technologies broader more efficient and bigger uh and uh, sort of but at the same time they impact our present so it's it's not really an either either or question the things that we do for our future will make our present better and at the same time we need to focus on the pre- problems of the present as well yeah so more characteristically that sanse the better it is for the development of the nation is what i feel like as uh, uh, abdul kalam sir said uh, strength always respects strength uh yeah so yes so yeah divyan uh, so how many schools do you want to reach in another 2 years of time well we, i want to reach more than 80000 Okay. So, but like, let's see how it happens. So, how has the COVID situation uh, changed your outreach programs? I heard you are doing online uh, courses right now. Yeah. So, um, I think the education industry as a whole, uh, apart from schools and colleges themselves, uh, I think the industry as a whole, all private players, whether it's STEM educators or it's uh, other sort of uh, sort of education uh, things that we have whether it's coaching classes or uh, or sort of robotics labs or uh, you know other experience educational experience companies i think all of them today are feeling that uh, covid has sort of been a little bit of a blessing in disguise uh, we may all be taking a lot of hit on our revenues on our current systems and things may be falling apart and very difficult right now but what is happening right now is a fundamental change where the acceptance of online education uh, and the acceptance of the way parents schools teachers students approach an online lecture uh, or 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 a online activity or an experience is changing drastically and the acceptance is really booming and people are really starting to value uh lectures even if they are online it is not always about having the person present in the classroom or in the campus uh one of the biggest problems that we face while uh, trying to partner with new schools uh up till pre covid up till 2019 i would say used to be that if we wanted to set up a lab or do a workshop it used to entail anywhere between 5 to 25 visits to the school from the starting where you know first is you are pitching the thing 
you're creating a proposal you're getting things approved you're executing the event you're taking the payment and so on and these this this 25 visits or these these used to take up a lot of operational cost lot of time especially for a company like rocketeers which is trying to concentrate pan india and not really regionalize our services uh, that used to impact even more because we didn't have people everywhere so we literally had to travel to these different cities and different places and that that was very high cost um now suddenly you have a situation where schools have started understanding that what they need is the material and we can do our thing online uh, we we may need one visit or two visits to set up a lab do the installation maybe do one in house teacher training offline but on a broad level they, we can do all the lectures we can do student engagement we can do activity monitoring we can do uh, competitions we can do project based learning everything can happen online uh, and and we don't need to go there and and that more than anything is a mindset change the thing that's happening is the same the number of students that is being engaged is the same the end result for the student is the same just the mindset change of the meeting can happen online nahi to all the time it used to be please come to the campus to meet this teacher please come to our campus to meet the principal to meet the owner of the school to meet this trustee to do this now it's like okay how when can we set up that zoom call where we can introduce you to these people so it's it's a it's a mindset change that i think is a blessing in disguise and over the long term it will really be a good thing uh, and and uh, and what we need to do right now is all of us so i think that's what most of us are trying to do is survive and where we lower our costs do what we can and make sure that we are out there the once this is over and and uh, then maybe we can build from strength to strength yeah so uh, talking about the from a revenue standpoint right i think uh, in uh, previously you mentioned that uh, your your focus is mainly to bring the cost of rockets and rocket components down so once you begin yeah. once you begin selling after after bringing the cost down yeah. wouldn't you be selling it for a lesser price so unless you expand you will you will lose money in that case so uh, how would so uh, see there are uh, see see there are various aspects to it uh, so uh, i'll give you one example okay uh, let's take the example of ignition systems for rocketry so uh, when you start building an ignition system for rocketry the first sort of solution that presents itself is nichrome based ignition where you have a nichrome based igniter which is fixed into the propellant and then you are powering that nichrome uh, through a battery or through an electrical system uh, which will have certain consumption of electrical power and it will convert that into heat which will then sort of ignite the propellant and it's it's like a so so you see this in a lot of places yeah so in airports usually as cigarette lighters where you press a button it heats up and then you uh, sort of burn your cigarette using that so so that's uh, that's it's the same system that's applied to uh, a rocket ignition system but usually the primary difference is that at an airport or at, at any place like this it is connected to the grid pressing the button you are getting 220 volts ac supply at unlimited power whereas whenever you are flying a rocket you are probably out there somewhere in a remote field with no electrical Uh, sort of connections near you so what you need to use is a battery uh and this first system that me or any rocketeer would build would have a very large battery minimum let's say a bike battery which is a 7.5 uh, ampere or 12 volt battery which is lead acid it's it's really expensive uh 9 10 uh, uh, almost 1000 1100 rupees just for the battery uh then uh, apart from that all the other components to convert that into a good supply and then the nichrome itself is expensive so now if you want to buy nichrome uh, as a you end user if you want to buy just say 2 meters of nichrome uh, because at a, at a time you're using just 2 cm so even if you're buying 2 meters you have 100 ignitions mm -hmm. right that 2 meter nichrome itself is going to cost you 150 200 rupees or unless you buy in bulk where you're buying by the kg if you buy a 10 kg roll then your per meter cost may be low but then you'll end up spending 9000 rupees yeah. for the roll um and uh, then all the other electrical components your switches your wire you need at least 20 feet wire to make it safe otherwise you might end up using a short wire which is an unsafe system all of these things add to the cost and make the cost of the system fairly high today i'm already selling 
a system at 800 rupees. How am I doing that? Our system works on a 9 volt high watt battery. It does not use nichrome. It uses an electric match. It works on low power. So we, we've optimized the whole thing such that the cost of building the system itself is fairly low in a country like India because we are using things that are available, components that are available in India and are more suitable for an Indian audience. Hmm. So that's how we try and approach the problem. We are not trying to replicate systems that are existing in the US or sort of for that matter in any other ecosystem. We are trying to reimagine them for an Indian perspective and look at things, how we can do things in a standardized, safe, reliable format and still make it as accessible as possible. Oh, I think Ashish has a question. So, uh, Devyansh, coming to the uh, entrepreneurship part, so how has that journey been for you? Because you started off from being uh, from a tech background. So how has entrepreneurship uh, taken you so far? Yeah, it's, it's been a lot of fun. So uh, uh, I think uh, entrepreneurship per se was uh, so, sort of something that I always aspired to. My father is an entrepreneur. So, uh, you know, it's, 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 it was not a new concept to me. The terminology may be new, uh, right? Uh, but at the end of the day, it's business. So, uh, you know, it's, it's just a different way of doing business. It's a different philosophy, you know, making it more agile, making it lower cost, sort of being able to change and pivot and sort of embrace technology and so on. Um, so, but yeah, it, it has hazard, ha, had its ups and downs. There are moments when you're very happy. There are moments when you're very depressed. Uh, but overall, it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of learning. You get to meet amazing people. You get to do a lot of exciting things. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it, it's whimsical in its own way. Uh, so, yeah, it's, it's, it, uh, I have my fun with it. Okay. So, uh... What I've heard is that you started uh, your first business with your friend. Then yeah. it went, it didn't go well. So what was yeah. your learning from it? So very seriously, uh, we weren't really doing pub-dub like properly. We, we, we did a few things. We built an app. Um, uh, we, we partnered with some three, four different restaurants. We provided some loyalty points. I think some 200 people used our thing. Uh, over four months. Um, there was some interesting data. Uh, we got good analytics out of it. We did some interesting projects for Prost in Kormangla. Uh, uh, if you guys know. Uh, uh, yeah. And uh, so so we, we, we sold a lot of their nachos. Uh, but very honestly, it was more about just, you know, going to Prost and having free beers. <laughs> so... Like we got paid in beers. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, did you get any funding for Rocketeers or uh, how have no, we funded Rocketeers? Boot. No, no, we, we've okay. been completely bootstrapped. And uh, one more thing from uh, one of the interviews that I heard was uh, you left Isro <laughs> because you didn't want to finish the one year mark. Uh, exactly. Yeah, because, uh, yeah, one year mark was something that was, uh, so like, it's, it's, it's like in your head, right? Like, ke, haan, ek saal pura ho gaya, and like you're, you're celebrating being there for one year and stuff like that. And uh, I didn't want to be like, uh, like, I didn't want that to happen. So I quit at 11 months. <laughs> so uh, while manufacturing uh, uh, these, see, I have tried uh, potassium nitrate with sugar. Uh, yeah. For solid propulsion, but uh, so, uh, I've tried uh, it. See, sugar as a propellant is not reliable. Uh, okay. there, it has its own problem. Even if you know that I want to add 200 grams of sugar and 800 grams of uh, potassium nitrate, and I'm going to use this this casing, and I'm going to do it like this. This is the temperature it's controlled. Exact drop by drop I'm giving. So exact quantity, exact mixing, all processes optimized. You know, very efficient. You are going to make 20 motors, all 20 are going to perform differently. Okay, that's that's an inherent problem of sugar as a fuel. Uh, it's, it's a fundamental property issue. So, uh, in that sense, uh, since we as a company try and create products that are reliable and safe, sugar was something that was out of the window on the first day. 
so we 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 wanted to concentrate on fuels that are more reliable that are safe and uh, that 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 we can model and that we can sort of have mathematical models for create a proper system that's optimized is going to perform in the same way every time until and unless there's a fault in the process and it's it's very identifiable measurable uh, so in that sense sugar was never really a fuel for the product sugar is a fun fuel to experiment with rocketry if you're learning you can build it you can make it very easily you literally need one induction stove some sugar and potassium nitrate potassium nitrate b if you don't have you can buy khad from the market manure you can just use manure yeah so uh, you know in that sense it's 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 uh, it's got its own benefit if you are practicing it safely and you are sure that you are going to do things safely it's definitely a fuel that you can experiment with you can fly a few rockets you can burn down a few rockets because they will burn it's, it's sugar okay <laughs> because keto so, is a failing mode that is going to happen um so uh, all those things are there uh, so we we started concentrating on concentrating on black powder which is a carbon based fuel uh, pure pure charcoal based fuel and uh, it's it's more reliable it's, it's it it performs in the same way every time it has its own flaws like it's fragile the grain grain profile is very fragile so it's very difficult to handle and so on uh but then that's the fuel that we concentrated on up till now we've commercialized a class b class c class motors uh c class we we are slowly expanding to d class we feel that we'll be able to do d class in the same fuel e class will be further bigger we might be reaching the ends of the envelope of black powder by that point of time after which we will we will probably move on to apcp uh so as you make more powerful motors certain fuels may not be able to survive that for example black powder black powder has a specific impulse of a, like a very good black powder has a specific impulse of 80 newton seconds so at that level you may be able to reach a e class envelope but then it will have to be it will be a very high cost product in that fuel because you'll have, you'll need to make it very efficiently you'll need to use very optimized processes there will be no scope for error uh and that doesn't work uh, you need to have you need to work in a range and uh, so in that sense you may not be able to reach with black powder over there so then we'll start using apcp apcp is ammonium perchlorate composite propellant um so that would probably be our next fuel after this and not really sugar okay so uh, coming to this uh, fuel uh, so how do you maintain the consistency you have some semi automated uh, process to manufacture yeah so uh so what happens is that uh, the process that we have is human monitored but machine executed so okay. we we don't have intelligence so one thing is that uh when you are working with black powder you cannot have an electric connection so the room mm-hmm. in which black powder uh, is being made and processed there are no electrical components or machinery present in that room that room itself does not have an electric connection so uh so whatever process that you make i can't have a motor running to mix the fuel even if i'm using a ball mill the motor has to be outside the room and it needs to be a belt mechanism okay or a, or a gear mechanism of some sort of motion transfer okay so uh that makes it very very high cost and then the operations become very difficult because the operator of the motor or the operator of the system has to be outside the room where he cannot observe uh the system directly so what we have is a hydraulic based system it's a hydraulic system which is not running on an electrical system but it's running on human power so uh, we have a hydraulic uh, a person who's operating the hydraulics uh, so you can imagine mechanicals from aladdin um, oh. and uh, so it's 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 a system that sort of looks like one of those mechanicals contraptions from aladdin where you have a lot of levers and things that you pull and press and you have specific motions associated with it and uh, the powder goes through sort of that process yeah um, divyam so coming to uh, this uh, manufacturing process uh, yeah. so where did you manufacture it you so uh, we uh, had a lot of changes in our manufacturing location over time uh, the current manufacturing location in covid times is a secret <laughs> <laughs> but uh, up till pre covid times we were manufacturing in a place in vani uh, so we have uh, we we partnered with a licensed uh, explosives unit in maniwani is about 100 kilometers from nagpur mm. 
so we have a partner there and we use their facilities uh, and our system is deployed over there uh coming back to the education uh, uh, field that we were talking about uh, how important is the practical aspect of learning according to you oh it's definitely very important i think it's going to be the core of uh, you know uh, all education uh, things at all points so uh, rather if you look at the current uh, sort of scenario we are moving away from rote learning to practical application and uh, that is definitely going to be so one thing is that we at times don't really understand what practical education means uh, we we try and convert even practical education into a very process oriented rote learning sort of a thing where you know every student is doing exactly the same thing every time that's not really how experiments or sort of practicality works so uh, there needs to be a freedom to move around for the student to be able to do things their way to make mistakes and uh, to sort of learn from those mistakes and so on so i think uh, one thing that digital technologies are enabling is um, us letting the students to be able to do that so earlier what used to happen was that any practical education used to be very very controlled circumstances where teachers or sort of educators could not really allow i uh, students to break things because that was a problem uh, and i think we're we're slowly trying uh, we we've, we've slowly sort of started building systems that can break and then be reused and then can be fixed and then can be reused and then so so sort of really allowing the student to experiment that's happening now and uh, in that sense diy hands on practical practical stuff is definitely very important and we need to learn uh, to sort of start including that into our education system um there was this one story that i heard from a journalist uh, uh who is in delhi he's a pol- political journalist uh and uh, he was he, he was meeting some diplomat from the us and uh, their car broke down uh, the diplomat's car broke down so this guy uh, sort of gave gave him a lift uh, out of the main vista of delhi in the latians area they were and this guy was riding on a bullet it was a big bullet and uh, so i think the 500 cc model or whichever it was and uh, i think they were having severe amounts of bad luck on that day and what happened was that that bullet also broke down so uh, at this point uh, this journalist whose bike it was he was like okay i'll take this to the auto shop and get it fixed and i don't know what's happened and uh, we need uh, i'm i'm really sorry uh, i'll call you an uber or something um and the guy who was there from the us the diplomat he just on the side of the road knelt down uh, looked at the bike touched it on a few parts took out the spark plug fixed it himself and put the spark plug back and the bike was working and the difference is that and by the reason that he was able to do this is not because this person was very interested in bikes or new bikes or understood bikes on a level that most people don't it's simply because uh, working with your hands is something that is an inherent part of their education system mm. and everyone has to work with their hands everyone has to use tools everyone has to do these things as a part of the curriculum and that makes them much more susceptible to being able to put that spark plug back on the bike again and do this and just move on with life so so that's what is an inherent change that we need to sort of introduce it's a very small example but it showcases what a difference in philosophy of education can do <laughs> yeah 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 yes sir i think i think we've covered most of what we would we'd we'll love to hear from you and uh, because rocketing was something that was uh, probably uh, very common for me and shreyas as well uh, when we were growing up uh, because we were lots of hands on guys and tried to do a lot of things practically so it's been a great uh, time talking to you devyanshu uh, thank you for agreeing to doing this with us thank you guys this was fun uh, interesting questions very nice conversation i had a good time thank you thanks thanks devan thanks for joining thanks for taking your time out first of all uh, to do this thanks hey guys thank you so much for tuning in we have lots more to come on this channel since we have lined up a few more guests after this be sure to like share and subscribe and hit the bell icon to receive updates in the description below i have provided the linkedin page link followers on linkedin to receive new notifications so until next time it's goodbye